Hello everyone, I'm Paul Kegebein with the Garland County Library and tonight's program was booked by the Garland County Master Gardeners as part of their virtual Know It to Grow It series and the Master Gardeners have recruited Alan Bates, the City of Hot Springs Urban Forester, to present to you tonight about pruning trees and all things crepe myrtles. So with that in mind, uh, before Mr. Bates joins us, I'm once again gonna introduce one of my favorite regulars to work with, Judy Dare, who's the chairwoman of the Know It to Grow It committee for the Garland County Master Gardeners, so she can share some of her information with all of you. So welcome, Judy. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry that I'm having some audio issues, but I think Paul's got it worked out on his end. First of all, welcome to the program tonight. We're so happy to have you. And I'd like to say one quick word about our sponsors. Every Master Gardener project has a sponsor behind it. And our sponsor behind us is Garland County Library. And we really appreciate whatever they do for us because they do it in such a great way. And all of our projects have great sponsors. So we thank those sponsors. Um, we won't have a Know It to Grow It in March, but we'll make up for it with two in April. So on April the 6th at six o'clock, Randy Atkinson with the Solid Waste Department of City Hot Springs will talk to us about recycling. He's also going to share with us some events that will be happening in this spring that you can also participate in, such as your, the electronics um, gathering and um, some lakeside cleanup. So Earth Day is later on that month. And of course, last year we didn't get to have our big Earth Day party. So on Thursday, April the 22nd at six o'clock, we have a special Earth Day program. We're gonna have a special speaker and we're also gonna have a special door prize. So speaking of door prizes, we have a door prize every time we have a note to grow it. And so for the first three people who post a comment or a question on this program, you can go to the library tomorrow afternoon, noontime, and pick up your door prize. So people have asked me what is in our door prizes. So let me just give you a quick little tour of our door prize bag. First of all, we've got every Master Gardener's Dream. It's the kneeler. It helps you with your weeding. We've got a wonderful yard works tool for you. It's either going to be a spade or a dig or something like this. This month we're going to have little markers so you can put them in your garden and put the name of your plant or your vegetable on there. Then we have this great little tote to carry it in with. And last but not least, we have a earth key ring because we never want you to forget we only have one earth and we need to take care of her. So without further ado and back by popular demand, I'd like to introduce Alan Bates. Alan will talk to you about pruning, uh, the correct way to do it and the incorrect way to do it. And also the problem with crepe myrtle bark scale. If you haven't noticed all the black crepe myrtles in hot springs, please look around and see how many we have. The problem is really growing and Alan will talk to you about what we can do about that. Alan is the city of hot springs urban forester. Um, let's say his background. He attended ASU on a, ASU, uh, on a rodeo scholarship and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. He taught vocational school and agriculture at Lake Hamilton High School after a 25 year in production forestry. He served as Garland County Agriculture Horticulture Extension Agent for seven years before moving on to this title of, um, pardon me, Hot Springs Urban Forester. Uh, he is a certified arborist as well as a qualified tree risk assessor. He and his wife, Linda, live on their farm near Hot Springs Village. They have a son, Tice, daughter-in-law, Holly, and a granddaughter, Adeline. So please let me introduce Alan Bates. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, it's that time of year. Every, every year in the late February, I get lots of calls, especially when I was at Extension, on how to prune. Uh, when to prune, uh, what you look for in pruning. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And as Judy said, we do have a big problem with the bark scale in hot springs. That came about about five years, six years ago. Time gets away. But uh, it wasn't even in Arkansas until then. And so I did come in and plant materials from other states. I first noted I was an agent at that time for the extension service. I did notice it in mostly started in South Hot Springs. 
but but now it is all over our whole county, even up in Hot Springs Village. So we're going to talk about pruning. Uh, I have it broken down into two sections. One is going to be ornamentals. We'll talk about that first. And then we'll talk about tree pruning and uh, a little bit about that. Let me get my slide started here. All right, part one is going to be pruning ornamentals, and then we'll get into pruning trees. Anytime we prune, there's three questions we should always ask. You know, why am I pruning? When do we prune? What time of the year, especially if we have ornamentals and we want to preserve those flowers? Uh, and then how do we prune? So we're going to break that down and look at all of those different ways or different things. Number one question is always, why do we prune? The reasons for pruning, there's many. Obviously, the one that we, we start with is removed any damaged, dead, or diseased wood, the 3Ds. So if we, and I would, I would throw this out there now. We had some below uh, negative degree temperatures here not long, last week. And so I've already noticed some of our bushes, some of the, the, the lower pedalum for one around the city are browning out. And so there can be some damage that we may have to remove because of all the cold weather that we had. But the first thing we always look for when pruning, for reasons to prune, would be to for any damaged, dead, or diseased wood. Any type of structural problems. If the branches are crossing, if they're rubbing, if they're growing inward on the tree, a lot of trees and disease problems, especially if we're working with fruit trees, can be eliminated by opening that airflow up in the middle of that tree. So any of those limbs that are crossing over or rubbing together, excuse me, those type of things we want to look at. Also, there are reasons to prune. Any hazards, we run into that a lot in the city where we would have uh, limbs that are hanging down in the sidewalks that are obstructing signs, <coughs> pardon me. And uh, those are a lot that we do see in the city as far as uh, eliminating hazards. Improving flower display, we'll, we'll break that down a little more in a minute, uh, depending on when those flowers come on your plant but we will help improve our, our display for pruning. Increase the light levels. I mentioned that a little bit a while ago, but it's real important uh, to get that light inside your plant and airflow. That helps in your disease, controlling disease. And if you're growing flowers or fruit, well, then that especially helps to get that sunlight in there. So light levels is real important on the interior of your plant. Reduce your plant size. This is a little tough one. You know, we run into the crepe myrtle. I have a special session section in this on crepe myrtle, but we can run into some problems with a too large of a plant. And a lot of people like to head them back. And so we're gonna talk about that a little more too, but reducing the size of the plant is can be a reason. And then aesthetics shaping some of us shape our plants and so forth. We want them to look good. The next question we should ask is when do we prune our trees? When do we prune our flowering shrubs as we're talking about those? So we break them down into two categories. Are they spring early bloomers? These are the ones that set their flowers on older wood. Uh, normally set flowers on these would be the buds in late summer or early fall of last year for our early bloomers that we're about to hopefully see for too long. But all of those are early spring bloomers. It makes a difference as far as when we prune them. We'll break that down. And then the summer bloomers, which are usually bloomed on the current, what we call current year's growth or current season growth. And so those would be pruned. And so the plants that flower on old wood I've listed a few here, uh, the azalea, the forsythia, uh, the magnolia, fringe tree, some of your hydrangeas, the big leaf or the, or the oak leaf, and uh, rhododendron and so forth. So these flower off of old woods. So we would prune them after they flower. Now, another little, a lot of people will say, well, I have azaleas 
that are continual bloomers. They have a big bloom in the spring, and then we have the, the encore, or whatever they may be, that bloom throughout the summer. Those fall in this category. We, we should prune those. The gardenia and some of these others should be pruned immediately after flowering. So you wait till after they flower to prune those. Old wood, here's some pictures. Obviously, the forsythia, quince. We're getting close. Those will be the first ones. That's kind of our uh, sign that spring's about here. Our summer's just coming our way. So it shouldn't be long, but those are our early bloomers. And remember, they flower off of the off of the growth from last year. So we would wait till after they bloom before we ever prune those. Plants that flower on new wood. Uh, the Althea Rosa Sharon, the Bidet Butterfly Bush, Crepe Myrtle was a big one that we're really looking looking to be pruning here before too long. And some have already, hopefully we're, we've waited, but, but we should be pruning those before too long. The Vitex, uh, the Chase tree, that's kind of a, a tree that I've been promoting around our city. I have a, I'll talk about that a little more in my presentation, but it's kind of a tree. It is a tree that can be replaced the, the crepe myrtle and it doesn't have any problems. It's the same blooming schedule about two to three months in the summer blooms off of the new current growth, just like the crepe myrtle, and uh, doesn't have any disease or insects. In fact, it's a very good attractant of bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. So I'll talk about it a little more also in the presentation. So we prune those before new growth. Usually done in late February. You have to kind of throw that out there. I usually tell people we prune these when we think winter's over. Well, I thought winter was over a couple of weeks ago, but obviously I was wrong. So we have to kind of think. So traditionally, we would just say the end of February. That would be the best time that we are. If we want to put a date on it, that would be the time to really think about starting to prune these plants that uh, grow off of that new wood, such as the crepe myrtle. <clears throat> there's a few pictures of, and there's a very beautiful crepe myrtle in there. All right, here's the big question that a lot of people like to dig into a little deeper is how do we prune? And some major considerations we would look at is, is how does my shrub grow? Does it have a main trunk? Is it a single trunk or a main stem? Or is it a cane producing plant with multiple trunks? That's the first question you should ask before you start pruning. And then the same questions we just asked. When does the shrub flower so that we don't cut off that? I have a neighbor that lives on the road that I own, and every year in uh, early February, he prunes back his forsythia. And I told him the other day, I said, I don't know if you understand this, but you're cutting off all your flowers before they ever get a chance to bloom. So knowing when it blooms is real important. Do you have a cane producing shrub? They benefit from rejuvenation pruning or uh, renewal pruning. Well, we use those terms back and forth, but they're the same rejuvenation pruning. Cane producers that we're talking about are the, the forsythia we just mentioned, uh, the red, tip, uh, red, red twig dogwood, the quince, the nandina, butterfly bush bedelia, all of these are, are the, and they regenerate from the ground. So you can prune those back very heavily. Cane producing shrubs respond well to renewal pruning Renewal or rejuvenation of that plant that typically results in a better flowering and fruiting. So how do you renewal pruning involves removing the largest limbs or canes at the ground line? So you can remove some of those canes, usually about a third of them. In severe cases, we you know, you can take the whole plant down, but but that would be uh, to reshape. But we can take a few of the of the about a one third of the canes at the ground to open that middle up to give it airflow and to rejuvenate it. As this picture is showing, we should cut our plants off as close to the ground as we can without leaving a stub. When you leave that stub, you'll get a lot of epicormic or water sprout growth from that one stub. And, and uh, it really won't, it'll come from that point and then you'll have some dead wood under it. So cut it as close as you can. Don't leave the stubs and you remove about one third of the canes at any one time. Very good picture of a before and after 
I have a segment in here on a crepe myrtle that will similar to that. But as you can look at that picture, you can see the picture on the left, the before picture. We have limbs that are growing back into the middle. We have limbs that are crossing over. And once they take, have taken those out, you see a good clean plant on the right uh, that has good airflow through it, that you don't have limbs rubbing, crossing over. And so this will help on your disease it'll help on your flowering because you're getting more sunlight it'll help get some airflow in there you know a lot of our plants like the crepe myrtle have some problems with some leaf spot diseases and some powdery mildew and things like that well that's attributed to not opening that middle up and letting the air get in there and it uh, holds that moisture in and it can cause those problems with fungal problems so very good example there some of the shrubs that lend to what we call selective thinning. Now, this is, a little, this is going to be more of your single stem or, or stems that you don't want to cut down at the ground. You want a more of a, a thinning. Now, a thinning cut is usually a cut. Here's a thinning cut. At the main trunk, when you follow the limb back, the picture on the left with the, with the little hand shears, you want to cut that off and follow the limb all the way back to the main uh, juncture. It may be on another limb or it could be on the main stem as this one is. And then on the right, this is called a heading cut. A heading, and they're cutting just above a node. You never want to leave a, a, a node open on the bottom of the bud. You want to always cut above a bud. When you cut below the bud, then that area, what we call the internode between the lower bud and the bud that you cut off, is a place for it to, uh, it won't heal back. It won't uh, compartmentalize over. It will just have a stub there with, uh, it can get disease and the insect problems in it. So always cut right above a bud or either cut back at the, these are called thinning cuts, back at the main stem. We'll talk more, I have some slides on how to make those cuts toward the end, but, but you do want to cut back uh, and uh, I'll be the right above, above a bud or back to the main stem. All right, ornamental grasses. Uh, can't think about ornamental grasses without thinking of my friend Gene Lichlider. Many of you, Master Gardeners know he passed away last week, and Gene did so much for this Master Gardener program. Uh, he taught the ornamental grasses and hostas at our master garden training for years. And then uh, he had did so much with the Habitat for Humanity homes and, and putting in the sod and the landscape. And uh, every time I think of ornamental grasses, I'm gonna think of, of, of Gene. And I just wanna send my condolences out to the master gardeners and to Dorothy and his family. So but anyway, ornamental grasses, uh, from the growing point of grasses is near the ground. And once we're past winter again, when is that? I, I believe we're, we're surely there now at the end of November or February. Uh, and we've enjoyed the grasses all and their foliage and their heads, seed heads. We can and we should cut the grasses back. Uh, in the case of large grasses, such as the pompous of the fountain grass, we may only be able to cut them back about 12 to 18 inches. The best way I've found is to take some type of maybe a rope or a, a string, tie it up, and then cut off right above that string. Uh, if, you, if you're if you capable of using a chainsaw, they work pretty good, and then back cut them. If you cut forward with it, it'll lock your chain up. But if you back cut right above that string, that's a good way to cut them back. Uh, here's one that's been cut back after the season. It's gonna come ahead, it's gonna go ahead and grow and do well. Here's what they look like if you don't cut them back. After years and years of growth, without cutting them back, you have the center of that grass is going to get uh, dead and, and hollow in the middle of your grass. So you want to cut them back before they start growing, because if you wait till they start growing, this is what you get once they start growing back in the springtime and you wait late. But then you get the jagged edges on the end of the leaves uh, in this case. They'll grow out of it. It's still, but the best time is to now and you see again what can happen if you don't. Okay, pruning trees. Uh, you know, I, hesit 
a kind of a rule of thumb for me is if I've got to get on a ladder, I don't recommend pruning that tree. But I would like to talk about pruning trees. I sort of do a lot in the city. If we have a crew working out, you've seen them. They're working on downtown of a morning. They can work up to about till traffic gets real heavy, but they get out early and they start and they quit about 10 in the morning. But they've been pruning all of our Chinese elms along the uh, Central Avenue there. But pruning trees for the homeowner, I would say leave it. You can as long as, like I said, if you, if you have to get on a ladder, I wouldn't do it. But if you have the tools with the poles where you can reach or either the crown raising down low, but I think it is important for the homeowners, if you do have trees pruned by a professional, that you know how to do that and you can critique their job when they're finished and give you a chance to look at how they're doing it and make sure that they're doing it right for you. So we're going to talk about pruning trees. And I believe Paul may be taking questions toward the end. And uh, we can, if you have questions about it as we go along, but pruning the, the one we always think about when we're pruning trees is crape murder. As Janet Carson always says, crape murder. And for the life of me, I can't understand why. I, I think I do in, in that people see other people doing it and they do it. I think that's the way to do it. But anytime you stress a tree like that, lots of things happen. You get all this what we call uh, when you release when you cut a head of tree off like this one in this picture you release what we call epicormic buds which are just under the, the the bark of the tree that are that aren't stimulated until that happens when you take that dominant uh, top off of that tree then that releases those buds instead of one stem now you have several stems coming out of the same limb and so over years and time, that makes that big knot on that limb right there uh, where that head cut takes place every year. So not a good thing. It's hard on the tree. It stresses the tree. It makes it more prone to the bark scale that we're going to talk about in a minute. But it's, it makes it more, uh, it's stressed. And so insects and the disease attack it more often. I'm not saying that bark scale doesn't attack the trees that we don't prune like this. But if since we've talked about this, if you look around town, the majority of the ones that are having the problem with the bark scale are, are ones that have been headed back like this. So we don't want to do that. And here's some more examples. The one on the top, top left, on the top left, to me would be a better way rather than the top right, just coming back to the same spot every year. At least they cut them off below those ugly knots. The bottom picture is showing some that I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they decided, you know, we did it one time, we didn't like it, we're going to let it grow. Well, that can be a way of recovering it, but you would need to cut away some of these others here and maybe leave only one or two stems. We did that at the courthouse. Uh, Master Gardner, some of you were listening probably remember that. We had Jim Robbins from the university come down and we wanted to recover these trees. And if you've done this in the past, they can be recovered. There's a couple of options. One, you can go ahead and cut them off this year as, as these are on the top left. Let the sprouts start back. There'll be multiple. When they get the size of your finger or a little larger in the summer, come back and prune out. Leave only two for each stem and then pick later, pick the one you want to keep. But that that way you get the tree growing back like it was and it can recover. There'll still be a little scar there, but you can recover from that. For crepe myrtles, the best option, you know, we're looking back now, obviously we've got trees that we're pruning, but the best option, if you have that, is to choose the right plant for the right spot. Because there's a great uh, variability on the plant size and ground cover, all the way from a ground cover up to a 30 foot crepe myrtle. The UAEX, your master gardener's uh, uh, homepage is on there, but that is a great resource. They have the listed crepe myrtles. There are eight different sizes of crepe myrtles. It lists those different ones in those categories. It gives you the, the color of them. They're disease resistant, very, very useful website. So go there. If you are putting new crepe myrtles, be sure you get the right one. That's the problem. A lot of people put a large tree where they want a small one. And so they try to hold it back and cut it back. Don't try to take a tree type 
into a small shrub using the radical pruning technique or techniques. And when you do prune, use selective thinning. We talked about that a few slides back. So that's the selective thinning is back to from a main limb back to its uh, parent limb and cut it off at the at that juncture or either cutting it off tipping it back at the very top back to a bud i like i mean that's an option here's some that's been done that way you can see these have been clipped back to a bud a growing point and they will do fine and they, again they will bloom off of that new growth so that's one method this is the best Jim Robbins at the university, if you go to uaex.edu and Google his crepe myrtle Jim Robbins YouTube presentation, this is an extract from that. You can He'll show this process of how this crepe myrtle got from the picture on the left and to the picture on the right. As we can look at it, you can see all the goings on in the middle that he removed, all the crossing over limbs as we talked about earlier, all the ones that are rubbing, uh, he's opened up the middle. Remember, we said how important it was for airflow to get through the tree. It's going to give you airflow to help com combat uh, fungal diseases and keep the tree healthy. So that gives you more of a flowering ability. The seed heads on there, I used to get that question a lot. Do you remove them or do you leave them? The answer is yes. It, it doesn't matter either way. Some people like to just grab the limb and run their hand of it and take those seed heads off, maybe for the aesthetics or the appearance of it, but it doesn't matter whether you take them off or leave them. Uh, in this case, it looks like he's left them. So there's a really, really good video on the UAEX that and I believe this is a tree they used in that. But you can see the difference in the two and how they're opened up and, and have taken the limbs out without cutting the tree off at four feet off the ground and let me grow back with multiple stems. So this is the best way to prune, in my opinion, to prune crepe myrtle. Now, as Judy mentioned earlier, we'll talk about the bark scale. Uh, what is bark scale? Bark scale is an insect. It is a scale. It attaches itself to the stem of the tree. And then it starts looking like this. If you look real close at this picture, the bark scale are the little white specks that's on the tree. They attach themselves. They suck the juices out of the tree. Uh, and then the black that you see is what we call sooty mold. It is from the excretions from the insect as it feeds and then it ferments. It'll wipe off. It will be, and usually if you've got something underneath that tree or leaves or any other thing under that tree is going to look like this also, but it will rub off. It will wipe off. Um, it's called sooty mold and it's from the insects over feet when they feed. Now here's what the bark scale adults look like up close little white specks on the tree we saw a while ago and so they will get very numerous i've seen them nearly that thick on trees here in the city and uh they are they're... now the next question you get will they kill the tree usually don't kill the tree they do stun it they do it doesn't produce as well obviously it's it's uh, not very attractive if you can catch them at this crawler stage remember i told you they attach themselves and they stay there and they suck the juices but they do have in a crawler stage. Usually it's in late March, early in the April time frame. You can take some sticky tape or roll a piece of tape on that tree somewhere in the up in the limbs and the crotches and check it regularly. If they do, you can see them, they'll get attached to it. Then you can spray with a uh, some type of insecticide. But the best control is a systemic, I'll talk about in a minute. This is a difficult one to control with, with just spraying the foliage. If you see one of these on your tree, don't kill it. How many, I can't see hands out there. If I was in the class today, I'd say, how many know what that is? Uh, but that is a ferocious little larva that will eat its weight many times of uh, these scale and help devour them. It's a natural way to remove them. So if you see one of those, you don't want to kill it. And that is a ladybug larva. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't even look like a ladybug. A lot of insects in the larva stage are predatory, are predators. The ladybug itself or the adult is also, it will feed on those as an adult and as a larva. So that's a natural way to help control that. So if you see one of those, don't kill it. 
I've had people bring those in to me before and say, well, how do I get rid of these? Well, you don't. You don't want to get rid of these. But the control is use a systemic. And it's real important on the timing of this. And I'll throw this out there also. If you have any hackberry trees, hackberries has a woolly aphid, which is also a sucking mouth part insect that uses that gets that same mold that we saw that sooty mold if you park under that tree or you have a deck that's under that tree you will see it on your that black sticky substance will be all over everything if you get on your windshield you can never get it off it seems like but this will do the same for it and the timing is important the timing of the year is in late march to early may is when we apply this product it mixes together, it systemics into the tree. You pour it into, you mix it in a gallon container, depending on the size of your tree, uh, it's how you measure, it'll have the instructions. But then you drench around that tree with this product and it systemics into there and it lasts for the whole season, for a whole year. The trick to this for the hackberry is you have to do it in the spring of the year to control the hackberry aphid in the late summer because by the time you see them in that time of year it's too late to do anything about it as far as the systemic systemic will stay in the tree we've seen i've seen some research on the crepe myrtle where it'll last up to two years so one year for sure you don't have to spray over the top and you can put mixes into the uh into water and pour it around the base of the tree there's several out there the aminocloprid is the most active or the most common one you see. The bear tree and shrub is uh, bear like the aspirin, and it is at Walmart, has it in some of your big box stores. It's, it's used. I, you can find some generic brands that are a lot less expensive. I, I'll tell you that much. I did last year for the city. I found some for about half the, or less than half the cost, but I, I buy it more in the bulk, so we do have to control it in our city also. But that's the best control and, and the timing again is very important late march to early may and then let it will last for up to a year and help control these the tree i mentioned earlier when we we're talking about pruning i compared it to the crepe myrtle i'm using a lot of these in the city it's called a chase tree or vitex uh, it blooms similar to the crepe myrtle it'll bloom summer two to three months in the summer uh, much more attractive to the bees and butterflies and hummingbirds than the crepe myrtle. If you come into our city on Airport Road, uh, city park there, uh, family park across from the airport, they put a new rail fence last year, and I planted about a two, about a month ago. I had I had planted thirty of these trees down that fence road. I'm hoping they end up looking like this one. And will be a great gateway into our city down that and it'll help buffer the sound from the road as the people walk around the park but i put 30 of those like this tree i had to go with a different the most common one is called shoal creek if any of y'all are interested shoal creek uh, vitex is the most common one i got one that was called forgotten now it was another variety i had to, I had to order and it only gets because of the height restrictions from the airport at the end of that runway, I had to put one that didn't get over 10 feet tall. So I'm saying all that to say there are other varieties. Delta Blue is the name of the one I put out there. But there are other varieties being developed that are smaller to larger. This one gets about 15 by 15, maybe a little larger in some instances. Full sun, blooms all summer, uh, can be a replacement if you, if you don't. And it doesn't have the problems that the crepe myrtle does with the bark scale. All right. Pruning large trees. Again, I, I mentioned this. If you have to get on a ladder, I would say, and I'm the, I'm the same way. I'm not going to get up in that tree. I leave that for, for the professionals. But one thing you can do, and we do a lot in the city because of, you know, when we plant a tree, it's usually on the side of the road, and we can't have a lot of branches down low. I'll say this. When you plant a new tree, don't remove those lower branches like this is showing here on a large tree. Leave those lower branches for the first two to three years. Now, you're going to have a height you're going to want to retain that tree at as far as under it. Maybe later in when it grows in your landscape for mowing the lawn or getting a little more sunlight under there to grow your turf or whatever. 
but in the first few years, three to four years, leave those lower limbs to help that tree grow. And then you can prune them off later. Uh, but remove those branches from the bottom of the crown. We have to in the city and, and you probably do around your house for vehicles, for people hit their heads on walking down the sidewalk or whatever reason. Uh, but do, don't overdo it. The ratio of the living crown to the total tree shouldn't be, at least two thirds should be left. Never take off more than a third from the bottom. And re crown raising is what this is called. And that's removing the limbs at the bottom. The cuts are made. You can see where they're made back at the main stem or either at the other, those thinning cuts. We'll talk about which I'll show you in a minute how to make those and, and uh, how to properly, because trees are, are so resilient. They uh, have what's called compartmentalization. When you cut it to the right point, they can compartmentalize and they, they uh, can heal over, uh, callus over more than anything. They don't really heal completely to the, but they do callus over and keeps that compartmentalized to keep out disease and insects and, and, and not being exposed. So that is one thing you can do is a crown raising, cutting those lower ones if you have to. Maybe you have an obstruction you can't see to get out in your driveway, uh, maybe up close to your house or wherever it may be, but that's called crown raising. Crown thinning is a little different in that selecting removing branches to increase the light. Again, that's important uh, in the crown and to avoid any unnecessary stress and prevent excessive production of what we call epicormic sprouts. Epicormic sprouts, we've all seen them. Uh, a real good example, and you'll think of it as soon as I say it, is, is trees on a, a utility line where they've came through and they've cut the trees off just hack them off below the utility line. And now instead of one limb, you have 15 growing out of the same area. It's really weak growth. Uh, it will break down in the storm. It's not healthy for the tree, but crown thinning is a little different. We're not coming through and just cutting off the top. We're following branches back to the main stem. You see those blue highlighted pictures there on that crown and then the red line where it's being cut off. So those are being cut back to a main limb or a main stem and cut off at the, again, we'll talk about those points of cut at the end of the presentation. But this is called thinning and you're cutting the fallen limbs back and cutting them off at another limb or another joint. So, and, you, and that avoids, that doesn't uh, trigger that mechanism in that tree to, to send out a lot of sprouts. You're not cutting the main uh, epicormic or the terminal bud off. So you're just cutting back at the at the limb back at the stem and you and you do uh, keep that from happening no more than about one fourth of the whole crown should be removed at one time we don't want to overdo it obviously we've all seen a lot more than that on the power lines that when they take them off now this one can be crown reduction uh, can be a a substitute it's not something we that we do a lot we we encourage a lot of but in this instance here, and let me throw this out there. If there's a power line around, the only people that can prune on that tree are certified in utility pruning. So you have to have someone and we don't obviously don't want to get around those power lines. So there has to be an expert involved in this case. But this example will show you a crown reduction properly. Uh, it calls so called drop crotch pruning where you come back you see the blue on the left where it's been removed. This is what we call where we remove back to a la lateral limb that is at least one third the size of the limb that you're removing. This is called a reduction cut. The opposite of that is when you come down, say the next limb below that blue, not the one right below it, but the second one, which is even smaller. Anytime you cut off at a point, and it's it and the limb that you're leaving is less than a third of the size of the one that you're removing then that is called a uh, heading cut and so those are much harder on the tree you do get the epicormic growing back a lot of uh, a lot of multiple stems will come that one area so this is an option if you if you wanted to lower your tree back and doing these cuts that we're calling a crown reduction rather than a topping or a heading cuts where you just discriminately go through and cut them back. 
Now our pruning cuts, how do we make them? There's a little better picture on the next one, but cutting them back at the main stem. This is a better example. Pruning live branches, we follow them back to what we call the, the uh, branch collar. And on the picture on the right, you see the branch ridge and then the little dotted red line is the correct place to cut that limb off. If you cut it any closer to the tree, just behind that and that bark ridge area, uh, the swelling area there, that has a, what it needs to compartmentalize that cut. Everything in, is internal there that, that can callous that over. It compartmentalizes it and then insects and disease can't get into it. I'll give you some examples in a minute that shows the improper cuts, but that's the proper cut. Proper cut just outside the bark ridge and angles away from the stem, avoid injury to the branch collar. The collar you want to remain, you don't want to cut it off. Make that cut as close as possible though to that stem of the branch axle, but outside the branch collar ridge. So then it's the stem tissue is not injured and then the wound will seal in the shortest possible time. I wish I'd have threw one in and I will next time a picture when it is healed over. Uh, it callous over and completely closed back up if it's cut at this point correctly. Now, if that limb had a lot of weight on it and was hanging out and you just did the cut we saw on the previous slide uh, at the branch collar, then it has a tendency to rip at the very bottom. Number three, it's the third cut at the arrow there. If you just cut it off at that cut, then with all the weight on that limb, it would rip it out and tear the tree and cause damage to it. So to avoid that, what we do is what we call a three cut method. First cut is an undercut, maybe a third or a fourth of the way into the limb. And then to move past that cut and do your second cut to sever that limb completely off. And then your third cut after the weight of that limb has been alleviated, you would come back to the third cut at the above the branch collar and then cut it off. That's used on large heavy limbs and it will save having uh, a, a scar or ripping of that branch at the bottom if the limb is heavy. Now another one is called a flush cut and this is an improper cut that's done behind the branch collar and they're larger, they don't heal over. You can see that one at the bottom, it's showing an example of on the right there of it healing over and it still leaves a large wound that never heals over. These flush cuts are a problem. Uh, do not try, do not cut behind that branch collar and then you will have, this will not be an issue. So um, flush cuts made inside the bark collar or the ridge, bark ridge and the branch collar results in development of wound wood on the sides of the pruning woods with very little wound wood forming to the top to bottoms. And that's that picture on the right. You see it does callus over a little, but we've all seen if you think back or if you, you'll see some that have been cut properly, they will completely callous over and close up. Stub cuts is when you cut too far away from that collar. And so now you still have the possibility of some of the, uh, the epicormic buds that will, you'll get a, a, a stem to grow back there. Most of the time it won't. And what happens is that little short piece, like at the bottom, picture on the, uh, the left side of the tree, a stub cut, then it will never heal for one. And then it's always a source of, uh, of, of uh, deterioration where insects, disease have to find a way into that tree. So it's real important where that cut is made for it to compartmentalize and heal back over. So that stub cut or flush cut are two, sign, are two types of cuts that uh, we do not recommend. All right, that went through a little fast maybe. So hopefully we have some, if we have any questions, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Paul, are you there? Can you hear me okay? I do hear you. All right, uh, you did get a couple of questions I got through email. Uh, okay. One of them you pretty much covered after it was sent from Patricia. She, she had asked what to do about insects and other pests. Did you have anything else to add on that? No, I just, the, the two main ones I deal with the most was the bark scale on the crepe myrtle and then the hackberry aphids. Uh, hackberry aphids, uh, some years, it depends on how much dry weather we get in late summer. 
If we get a lot of rain, they're not too bad. They're so small. We've all seen them. You may not realize it. If you've ever walked to your car in late summer and saw what you thought was a snowflake floating through the air, well, that's usually a hackberry aphid. That's some type of aphid. And they're the ones that feed and they, they uh, asexually reproduce and they reproduce so fast that they take over the tree and they just produce this sticky substance called honeydew that gets all over everything. Keep in mind with insects, when we, when we look at how to control insects, there's two things we first think about and that's what kind of mouth parts do they have? Do they have sucking mouth parts like the scale and the aphids I just mentioned? And so those are things systemics work very good on them. If they're chewing mouth parts like grasshoppers, beetles and things like that, then we have to use a different type of herb or insecticide. So mainly those are the two main ones that we have the most trouble with or I do in the city with trees, but that's your control for them. And then the other question was, uh, let's see, her name was Barbara. And uh, she asked if, if we have more winters, uh, winter storms like we did a couple of weeks ago, if that becomes the new norm, is there anything that should be done to help uh, protect the trees? You know, any, in all of your control or, or disease, insect, uh, environment, whatever it may be, the best control for anything is to have a healthy tree. And so that takes a little work. Uh, extension service is a great place to go. If you have a big oak in your front yard and you're wanting to keep that thing for as long as you can, the best thing I can tell you to do is do a soil test around that tree, get that back and try to meet that nutrient requirements for that tree keeping it as healthy as you can in nearly all books you'll read on tree uh, health or, or, or combating disease and insects is just like us. It keep it you know, healthier it is, the better it has resisting those things. So not much you can do about the storm on a big oak tree uh, other than, than trying to keep it healthy before all that hits. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Judy Dare with the Master Gardeners for organizing this. Uh, I believe she mentioned at the beginning that the dates for the next uh, couple of Master Gardeners programs we're doing with the library. But uh, ju just to repeat, um, there, there won't be one in March, but there will be two Master Gardeners programs, uh, Know It to Grow It series in April. And that's uh, April 7th uh, will be a, a program on recycling. And then April 22nd, that one will be Earth Day themed and we'll have more details and more official announcements uh, in the coming weeks on those two. And uh, Mr. Allen Bates, any, any final words you'd like to say? Uh, just that I am the urban forester and I'm there. If anybody needs uh, uh, any tree, I, I do still work with the public, even though I, I keep the tree, I try to keep the tree city trees healthy, but I do work with the general public also. If you have any tree questions, uh, like for me to come look at them, I'll be glad to do that. So I'm just, I'm an urban forester. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I can't ever remember my phone number at the office anymore because it's on the speed dial, but I am under the urban forestry in the city of Hot Springs. You can find me. So I'll be glad to do that. Yeah. The only reason I remember when I have a card right in front of I me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you have a good evening and thank everyone for watching. Take care. Thank you.